All right, thanks everyone for coming. Um, today I'm gonna speak a little bit about um, some of the overarching challenges in uh, IAEA safeguards verification at gas and future enrichment plants, um, or at least Princeton's perspective on this, um, before kind of going a little bit more into depth about one of the issues, which is uh, the timeliness of detecting misuse activities at large commercial scale uh, enrichment plants, or GSEPs for short. Um, so the first order of business is just to kind of state what questions we're trying to answer. Um, the first issue is, kind of what are the ongoing trends? What's happened, um, particularly in the last 10 years uh, since the last kind of major revision to GSEP safeguards was looked at by the IAEA? And then the follow-on question to that is, what can the IAEA do to keep pace with these ongoing trends? Um, so to provide a little bit of background at first, um, I guess at the highest level, right, so safeguards are conducted at civil gas centrifuge enrichment facilities both in nuclear weapon states like the US and the UK and in non-nuclear weapon states like uh, Germany um, and the Netherlands, um, respectively under voluntary offer agreements in the nuclear weapon states and comprehensive safeguards agreements, IMSA 153, and then also 540 for additional protocol states in the nuclear, non-nuclear weapon states. Um, remarkably, the safeguards approach um, at these facilities is pretty common across facilities. So that's what we call the hexapartite safeguards approach, which was developed in the early 1980s when Urenco was first uh, getting ready to uh, kind of go to commercial production and they were going to have facilities in non-nuclear weapon states, so safeguards need to be done on those facilities. Um, the HSP, Hexapartic Safeguards Project Approach, um, blended item-specific um, safeguards, so weighing, doing NDA, counting, putting containment and surveillance on items, like cylinders, um, but then also included provisions for inspectors to access cascade halls to do visual inspections to look for signs of misuse, which is pretty much HEU production or production of uranium enriched to excess levels. Um, this was added to over the years as technology became available and or necessary with continuous enrichment monitoring in the early uh, to mid 90s. Uh, we also saw the advent of environmental sampling as um, so that was rolled out across the IAEA, so that was integrated in the HSP approach. And of course we had the AP in 1997 which um, put some interesting measures in, like uh, complementary access and possible reductions in interim inventory verification in the case of a broader conclusion. Um, the latest thing that's been done is the revised model approach, essentially, which also added measures to detect undeclared feed. And that's important because undeclared feed can be used to generate makeup product, LEU, in the case of misuse, or it can also produce undeclared LEU, which can be shipped to a clandestine facility for further enrichment. Anyway, so what's changed since 2006? Um, and there are two real dynamics that we've seen. Uh, first, we've seen growth in capacity and scale globally of enrichment plants. Um, existing facilities have been expanded um, and new plants have been built. This is a combination of gaseous diffusion plants closing, particularly in France and the US, and also increasing expectations for LEU demand given the nuclear renaissance that was talked about prior to Fukushima. Afterwards, uh, we've seen a fall in demand uh, for enriched uranium because of the global slowdown in nuclear. Um, and we've actually seen 60 million SWU uh, worth of LEU, so that's over a year's worth of demand pile up, um, not necessarily in the form of UF6, but it's out there. Um, so the kind of bottom line here is that we've got more capacity for site, which means greater potential for quick breakout or misuse scenarios, and also there's a lot more material to take care of. So there are two safeguards issues writ large that we can kind of talk about here. I'm only going to talk about one of them today. Um, the first one is timely, de timely detection of HEU production. Um, that goes along with the capacity issue. And then there's also an efficiency question. Um, as these plants get larger and there's more material to account for, um, when does destructive analysis become too much of a burden? When do you have too many samples? When are there too many items to count? 
Um, when does your uh, error rate become unacceptable, uh, given the number of items that you have to account for? So those are the two issues. I'm going to look at timely detection of HU production today. All right, so when we're talking about kind of what this means, it's useful to kind of look at this and generate a scenario and see you know, in a maybe a non-idealistic setting what a generic commercial um, large stick, large scale GSET can do today. Um, so at Princeton, we put together this uh, time-stepping Python model to actually understand how flows of material and enrichments uh, can change in an enrichment plant during a misuse scenario over time and in um, off-ideal operating uh, scenarios. Um, so here's a generic plant that we're going to analyze. Um, we have one plant that's 4,000 tons through per year. That's actually on the smaller end of facilities today. Um, this plant consists of eight production units, which you can think of as kind of mini plants within a larger plants. So we have kind of eight smaller 500 ton SWU facilities, each with their own feed and withdrawal systems, cascades, etc. in this one bigger plant. And each of those units has 10 cascades in it. Um, so if you imagine kind of these 10 cascades working in parallel um, in an ordinary setting producing LEU um, and then producing some depleted tails in parallel into one kind of head up pipe. Um, and we have more assumptions here um, that aren't particularly important for what I'm trying to explain. Um, the separation factor, that's essentially the gain um, in enrichment you get across each stage. Um, it's the difference in the ratio of U235 to U238 in the product and tails lines of each stage, uh, respectively. All right, so to help you visualize what we're modeling a little better, we kind of made a five cascade unit. We used five cascades instead of 10 because it's easier to see on a slide. Um, essentially at the top you have feed withdrawal stations. This is where UF6, uranium hexafluoride, is fed into the unit and withdrawn. Uh, and then those kind of uh, feeds and withdrawal lines go into unit headers. So we have the fat green pipe. That's the unit feed header that carries all of the feed material from the feed withdrawal area to the cascades. Um, and in this header connection area, that unit feed header branches off into five, in this case, cascade feed headers. Does that make sense? Excellent. Um, and the same logic applies to the unit and cascade tails, headers, and the product headers. Um, there are many different scenarios that we can simulate. Um, we chose to simulate a cascade interconnection scenario because it uses the least amount of feed and is also, we found, the most expedient. So we're going to show you exactly kind of what happens next. Um, cascade interconnection involves connecting the product of a group of cascades into the feed of another group of cascades. So visually, you could think of it this way. So if you look to the right, we're going to block off the unit product header. Um, and we're going to connect the unit product header now into the feed of one cascade like that. So now we have the feed going into that first group of four cascades. And now it's going to be fed again automatically into one top cascade. And if we produce, or if we put in 5.1% LEU in, as feed, we get something in excess of 90% uh, coming out of the top in this situation. Um, so going back to the idea of other scenarios, we thought this scenario was appropriate because um, it's first expedient. It only requires one modification, essentially, which is connecting the product header uh, for the unit into the feed of one cascade. Um, the downside is that you do lose some SWU capacity because you have mixing going on in your cascade. Um, but it's actually not a terrible loss. It's about 50% in that top cascade, as you can see in this table, um, which summarizes kind of the whole process. Um, what's highlighted in red there is what goes into your modified unit that I just <laughs> described. All right, so here's uh, some results about e equilibration if you were interested. Um, this is what we used, uh, did with our, with our Python simulation. Um, so if you feed 5% uh, 
material into a cascade that had been chugging along producing LEU. Um, those cascades equilibrate in, let's say, about 10 hours. And that equilibrates in tandem with the top cascade producing 90% plus, and that process takes about 12 hours total. So this isn't a particularly long period of time to start production. All right, and when it comes to producing HEU, these are our estimates. Um, again, for a 4,000 tons per facility, um, there are two modes we thought about. So one mode is where there's no LEU sitting around um, to feed into a cascade. So if you don't have any LEU, you have to keep on producing it. Um, let's say in seven other units that you haven't modified. Um, and in that case, that top unit uh, or the unit that you've modified can produce about half an SQ per day. Um, and if you modify two units, um, you have less LEU feed going into those units, but you can still eke out about one SQ per day. Um, if you have LEU sitting around, you don't have to waste um, some of the capacity of your plant producing LEU because you already have it. So this allows for much faster production times. Um, so we are estimating 10.8 SQ in three days, or if you recycle the tails from each of those campaigns, you can continue producing HEU uh, for about a week and have about 29 uh, significant quantities worth of material. Um, so this is maybe good because it's like a factor of two slower than just doing a simple SWU calculation would have you do. Um, but the bad news is still these production times are incredibly short um, and it's not inconceivable to think that a, a, an operator with one of these facilities could break out in say a weekend um, or even less time than that. Um, so moving on to potential measures, um, we thought about first what's being done. We have LFUA inspections that, you know, if there are visible indicators um, that are in a cascade hall that show you that misuse is going on, that's a useful thing to have, but there might not be visible indicators. Um, there's environmental sampling um, that can detect HEU three weeks after you did the inspection, um, but that's not particularly timely because within three weeks, um, that operator could have produced several or more than several SQs of material. So those have, both these measures have, you know, good potential to detect misuse, but not in a particularly timely way. Um, the good thing is, is that we've been moving in the direction of becoming more timely. So we've seen the deployment of online enrichment monitors. Those were developed in the US and they're now deployed in Iran. Um, that can monitor the enrichment of the feed going into a unit, as well as the product and tails enrichments going out. Um, that provides a good degree of timeliness, as would load cell monitoring, which has been worked on as well as the unattended cylinder ver verification station. Um, all of these unattended measures have the potential to send go, no go type signals to the IAEA that can indicate whether enrichment levels in a given unit um, or a given plant are kind of compliant with whatever or consistent with whatever a state has declared. Um, the bad news is that there are still credible spoofing scenarios, we think, for all of these technologies, um, particularly if a state were to say, we just shut off that unit. Um, that would cause a lot of these indicators to give no-go signals, and that would be a credible scenario. Um, so we don't want to get in that situation. So we thought about going further. So right now we're just kind of detecting downstream signatures of misuse from the source. Um, what would be better is if we could detect reconfiguration itself um, inside a process area. So in the future we're suggesting still unattended measures, but means for detecting kind of piping reconfigurations themselves or the presence of hidden withdrawal and feed stations uh, beyond where we're looking now in uh, the uh, feed and withdrawal cells. So, just a few ideas to give people inspiration, I don't know. Um, first, this is kind of a simple thing actually. So, electronic seals, remote integrating seals that you could mount on sampling ports with the potential, so there are some sampling ports potentially that could be used to uh, do interconnection of 
couple of cascades, it would be a good idea to put seals on them to monitor whether they're being opened um, or if they're being used to connect uh, things that shouldn't be connected. Um, another idea would be surveillance at Cascade Hall access points. This wasn't something that went into the HSP originally, but could be useful now, um, given the highly increased potential for rapid breakout at modern facilities. Um, thirdly, this is maybe more avant-garde. Um, so if you are reconfiguring a cascade, this could involve sawing into a pipe or connecting things that used to be closed for a very long time. Um, if you open a pipe that had UF6 in it at a time, you're going to release some amount of um, UF6 or deposits, and some of that's going to hydrolyze and produce HF. So there's the potential to use maybe iSafe laser systems to detect the presence of HF in areas of process areas that HF shouldn't be in. Um, and then finally, something really crazy um, would be kind of mounting NDA uh, detectors, so maybe a helium-3 detector on something like a Roomba um, to detect um, HU from alpha N reactions from U234, which is enriched um, in tandem with U235 in the plant. Um, this kind of builds on a system that was developed at Los Alamos that used a stationary array of detectors, um, which could be very effective, but also expensive because it's a lot of helium-3. All right, so final thoughts. Um, the transmission frequency is obviously going to have to change depending on how big the facility is. Um, we have to give attention to authenticity, accuracy, data security. Um, these aren't things to be taken lightly. Um, and then we also need to think about potential benefits to operators, or we need to think about not inhibiting, inhibiting operator activities. Um, but there are ways to sell these systems. Um, HF detection is obviously a safety system as well. Um, if you put seals on sampling ports, this could be a way of mitigating insider threat scenarios. Uh, you might not want people tampering with your sampling ports if you're an operator of a facility. All right, so here's the challenge. Um, we've seen this growth in scale of uh, commercial GSEPs, and that's um, doing scary things to the potential for breakout at these facilities. Um, and we're already moving in the correct direction with unattended systems, but going one further and looking at detecting reconfiguration itself in unattended modes um, could be potentially very fruitful. Thanks for your time. And we use naive, naive bays, and we look at a way of calculating what is the probability of any given model in our database to the data, D, that we have collected. And this is obviously based on some sort of post- uh